Did you know the City of Tampa has its own archives? We store and care for a diverse collection of local treasures, like mayor's papers, old photographs, memorabilia, and even real archaeological artifacts, like this ceramic doll. Stay tuned and I'll tell you more about it. Welcome back. I'm Jennifer Dietz, Archives and Records Manager at the City of Tampa. Archives and Records is a division of the City Clerk's Office, and today I'm going to share with you one of our very oldest items, this tiny doll, which is part of our Fort Brook collection. Our Fort Brook artifacts were recovered from various sites in the downtown Tampa area. This doll was found during an excavation when the Tampa Convention Center was being built. It has been labeled as coming from the Fort Brook Hospital Kitchen Complex. Along with the other artifacts that were found, it helps us get a better picture of what life was like in this area back during the first half of the 19th century. Established on January 18, 1824, Fort Brook was named after its first commander, George Mercer Brook. On January 24, 1824, four companies of the 4th U.S. Infantry Regiment began construction of the officer and enlisted men's quarters, artillery batteries, and other fortifications. The important buildings were completed by late June 1824, but other structures such as storehouses, kitchens, an infirmary, and watchtower were added later that same year. The boundaries of Fort Brook were roughly south of Whiting Street, extending to the Garrison Channel and east from Nebraska Avenue. When the Tampa Convention Center was being constructed around 1990, this ceramic doll was one of the artifacts recovered from the site where the Fort Brook Hospital Kitchen once stood. Why would a doll be found on military grounds? George Mercer Brook allowed families to settle there, and his own son, who was named John Mercer Brook, was the first child to be born there. The Archives and Records Division of the City of Tampa acquired Fort Brook artifacts found at the Tampa Convention Center, as well as the Fort Brook parking garage. These artifacts are significant to the City of Tampa because they are the oldest items in our collection, and they help us connect with the past. But I really want to learn more about this doll and what life was like at Fort Brook. So I'm going to go visit local historian Ross Lamoureux at the Tampa Bay History Center. the Tampa Bay History Center, home to more than 60,000 artifacts. And we are here with an expert on Fort Brook history, Ross Lamoureux. Hi, Ross. Well, hello, Jennifer. How are you? Good. So we found this doll in our archive. And we know a few things about it already. We know that it was found during the excavation of the Tampa Convention Center. We know that it's part of our Fort Brook collection, but we would love to find out more. What can you tell us? Well, I can tell you that that is one creepy looking doll. <laughs> but we're judging that based on our kind of modern sensibilities about dolls. We know that at Fort Brook, the life of families happened there. The officers brought their wives, they had children. And we know this is a perfect example of a early to mid 19th century China doll. They're called China dolls for two reasons. One, made out of porcelain, but also a lot of them were imported from China before and, and later on. But this one is missing quite a few things. You have just the torso, and I can tell you that the, it had little pivot points for arms, legs. A lot of times they had a thread-like hair attached to them, and they were always clothed or and dressed. Sometimes uh, they came in very ornate fabrics. Uh, these dolls replicated the life of the people that had them. So if you're upper class, you're probably going to have an upper class clothing with that. And this is obviously a middle to upper class doll based on the intricacies, the, the fine work in the face and on the china. The lower class children tended to have homemade dolls uh, out of scrap cloth or even 
even in some of the more rural areas, uh, corn husk dolls were, were also common. So this shows the class of the family of the people. And one of the first questions I had about the doll from our staff is why would there be dolls on a military base? Because we typically don't think about that. But I know times were different then, so. They really were. Um, you're talking about a, a time that Florida is a very frontier area. Uh, it had just been taken over from Spain. The army occupies this fort, but also uh, back then officers were given a lot of options to bring families with them. Not so much for the enlisted men, the sergeants and the privates, but the officers did. And we know for a fact that Fort Brooke had several families here from the very beginning all the way through to the end. And that's great. And it, Fort Brooke has such a history. Can you tell us some more about the Colonel Brooke? I can. Who it's named after? Oh, George Mercer Brooke was a colonel in the 4th Infantry Regiment. He was tasked from the War Department to find a place uh, in the Tampa Bay area for a fort. So along with Colonel James Gadsden in 1823, they came by ship and they scouted out a couple locations. They landed at the tip of where now McDill Air Force Base is. Uh, that is today called Gadsden point after the Colonel James Gadsden. They went along further along what we call Bayshore Boulevard today and they came to the mouth of the Hillsborough River. Today the convention center sits there. They felt that that was a naturally a good location to build a fort. Uh, they thought at the time the Hillsborough River went a little farther inland and was wider. Uh, but it was a good place that they could see most of Tampa Bay. They felt this would be a good location eventually for a town. And so they uh, basically took that over for the federal government to use as a military installation. That was again in 1823. They came back in 1824 with four companies of soldiers from the 4th Infantry and began the construction of the fort, which was originally called Cantonment Brook. A cantonment is a camp or temporary fort. And so they built basically a wooden picket fence, a stockade fence around, and a, a blockhouse or two. Uh, as it continued to roll along, eventually you get outbuildings and Fort Brooke became a very sprawling complex with several dozen buildings throughout the years in various inceptions. But the very beginning history of it, it was a very rural fort, uh, uh, very wild territory and very little inhabitants in the area. And that's a good point that you mentioned about the buildings because the one piece of information I do have about this doll is that it came from the Fort Brooke Hospital Kitchen Complex. Absolutely. Would that make sense with the kids being there? That would there? make total sense because uh, back then kitchens were not a fixture within a building. Okay. They were cooking with fire, using fireplaces, so they were generally outbuildings. Women were involved heavily in cooking and laundry and different operations like that, so women and their children who would often accompany them and help them out, that would be a perfect place to find anything to do with children. So what did Colonel Brooke find when he came here? Well, when he came here, surprisingly, the area was cleared out. It looked like someone was here. There was uh, some dwellings uh, that appeared there and some animals. And somebody even brought in citrus plants, orange and grapefruit trees. Well, it turns out that Mr. Hackley had been given this land uh, deeded through Spain when it was still a Spanish territory prior to 1821. Well, the needs of the federal government superseded any of individuals, and that land grant wasn't valid after a certain time, uh, once Florida was given over as a territory to the United States. So basically, um, once Cantonment Brook and then Fort Brook was built, any dwellings or any, in this case, animals, he had cattle and some other small animals and the trees, uh, all of that was taken by the federal government. Uh, of course, he, Mr. Hackley wasn't very happy about that, but the War Department needs came over. Uh, it was involved in litigation for a while, but in the end, Fort Brook remained in federal hands and Hackley was out his dwellings and animals and land. So when was Fort Brook most active? I would have to say that in the 1830s and 40s was probably its most prominent time because this was during the Florida War, or as what we know now as the Second Seminole War from 1836 to 1842. This became the headquarters for the Army of the South, the Department of the South, and so soldiers from many different states, uh, volunteer and militia troops, sailors, marines, and soldiers were stationed right here at Fort Brooke through the various operations. Also, Fort Brooke was a location where Seminoles were brought in uh, prior to being sent out west to Arkansas and Oklahoma. This became a collection point where they would ship out from here in Egmont Key. So that period from 1836 to 42 was probably the busiest time with the most soldiers, the most construction, the most building going on, and that was a very active time. 
not just our local history, but in national history. That was kind of the Vietnam of the 1800s, so to speak. Whatever happened to Fort Brooke? Well, Fort Brooke uh, continued to be an Army post through the 1830s, 40s, 50s, uh, 60s. Uh, Post-Civil War, um, it, it kind of went into disrepair, disuse, but they would always have a caretaker or a few soldiers take over. Uh, eventually, by the late 1870s, the federal government realized that we don't need a fort here in this location. The town of Tampa had grown to encompass the area. And so in 1883, the last roll call of soldiers was called, and by 1884, it was ceded back to the city of Tampa. That's really interesting, and I know you've done a lot of research on the Civil War, and can you tell us about what Fort Brook was like? during the Civil War? Well, during the Civil War from 1861 to 65, it was a Confederate fort. Um, as soon as Florida seceded, and it was one of the first states to become a southern state in the Confederacy, Florida militia troops took over the fort. There were only uh, a handful of soldiers here as caretakers, so there wasn't a big armed action. Uh, and it was held by various groups of the Florida militia, um, you also had the, what was called the Florida Special Cavalry, or what's today called the Cow Cavalry, mm -hmm. which were volunteer troops who helped uh, round up cattle and bring those up through to Georgia for the Confederacy. Uh, you had two particular circumstances that happened uh, in and around the fort. Uh, in 1863, uh, there were federal sailors who marched from basically where Ballast Point is today around the town and sunk some blockade runners in the river. Uh, on their way back, they were met by troops from Fort Brooke at Ballast Point, and a small skirmish, which we today call the Battle of Ballast Point, occurred. That was in 1863. And in 1864, the fort was actually captured and held for two days. Uh, what makes this interesting is the troops that came in to capture them were African American soldiers, uh, what were then called the U.S. Colored Troops. They came in um, with help also from some other white soldiers from another regiment. Um, took over the, the fort, which only again had maybe a company of soldiers, 40 or 50 men. Uh, those troops ran upon hearing that hundreds of troops were coming into town. Uh, took over the fort, only held it for two days because part of the plan was just to kind of, it was a power play to show, hey, we're Union, we can come in here anytime we want. There wasn't a really pitched battle, but uh, uh, that's again is part of the record of that fort that it changed hands. One of the more interesting things that occurred during that time, however, on their way out, the soldiers were ordered to ditch the cannons from the fort into the river so they couldn't be used. So they tossed uh, several uh, artillery pieces in there. Uh, we know of three rifles that had been Navy guns uh, brought to Fort Brooke early on in the war by the Confederates. Uh, those were dumped in the river, and today those are the only two of those guns are the only pieces left of Fort Brooke uh, that are still around. Uh, they have been at what is today the University of Tampa in their gardens, uh, but at the time of the Tampa Bay Hotel in the 1890s, Henry Plant had those fished out of the river and placed in his Spanish Fort Garden or Spanish Fort Park that was built. Those are there today uh, with historical markers, so we know a little bit about them. That's incredible. And I know we have some Fort Brook artifacts in our collection, and you do as well, and you also have some that we loan to you over here. And can you tell us a little bit about the different artifacts you have in your collection? I can. Um, we, we have a lot of artifacts that you would think uh, military-oriented, buttons, hardware, buckles, things like that. But I think our most interesting pieces are like this doll, um, something that are more civilian in nature. We have from the city, for instance, a toy iron. Mm -hmm. uh, we have other d pieces of dolls. Uh, what I think are very interesting are uh, different beads that we believe were native trade beads. And you can tell age and, and things by the different materials, the different shapes. And, uh, Archaeology is never an exact science, but if you know a little bit about the sociology around it, just like this doll, even though you have a piece, you can fill in a story with those. And that's why I love finding these non-military objects on a military installation, because it showed there was more to life than just the common everyday soldiering. Yes, and I think that's the most fascinating thing, too. And you're working on a book, actually, on Fort Brook, I heard, right? I have been for a very long time. I need to get <laughs> unlazy and get back on that. But uh, for several years, I've been doing a lot of research. I've been compiling reports from the National Archives and taking my experience through living history and understanding what life is like in the mid-19th century and hopefully have that here around uh, 
sometime next year. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Ross. I really learned a lot today, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Absolutely. My pleasure. This is a passion of mine, this local history, but particularly Fort Brook. And I just have one last stop before I can return this doll to our collection. standing in Cotenchobee, Fort Brook Park, just outside the Tampa Bay History Center. The name of this park, Cotenchobee Fort Brook, not only refers to Fort Brook, but also to the Native Americans who once called this land home. Cotenchobee is derived from the Florida Seminole word meaning where the big water meets the land. And this area where we're standing is actually where Fort Brook used to be standing. So the next time you're visiting the Tampa Bay History Center, stop by Cotenchobee Fort Brook Park. Thank you for watching Out of the Archives. Tampa has a rich history and it's been fun sharing it with you again. For all of us at the City of Tampa's Archives and Records Division, I'm Jennifer Dietz.